Thank you to our choir for leading us um, and for repeating my message to the children like perfectly right after it. I should have just had you all sing to the kids. <laughs> they might have gotten it better. Next week, if you uh, don't, don't know this, next week our uh, choir will be singing their uh, cantata during our Palm Sunday worship service. And so they will be leading, telling the story of Jesus through music and word. And I'm excited to hear. Uh, they've been working on it for quite a while. And it's always a beautiful day and a beautiful way to worship God. So I'm excited for that. Um, join us next week for that during this service. And uh, invite your friends and, and do all you, you can uh, to join us for that. It'll be a, a, a wonderful day. Uh, there will also be a bake sale uh, happening. And I believe, uh, I don't know for sure, but I'm fairly certain that the proceeds will be going to the camp, uh, uh, to the uh, camp scholarship fund. As I looked at the emails. That was the, the phrase that I kept seeing the most. Tom, are you agreeing with me? Okay. The only one on those emails. <laughs> so uh, that will be next week. There will be a big sale, um, and uh, for the kids. And if you uh, want to pick up some goodies for your Easter, for your or Holy Week, uh, you can pick that up on um, Palm Sunday. And those proceeds will go to our camp scholarship fund. We have already have four kids signed up for camp. I'm sure we're going to have more to come. So if you would like to participate in sending our kids to camp, you can do so by putting uh, some funds in the offering plate or uh, by giving online uh, specifically to our camp scholarship funds we like to give uh, to each camper so that they can all go and, and uh, participate in our wonderful camping program uh, throughout the Dakotas. And actually, we're even blended into Minnesota. We got a couple kids going to a camp in Minnesota this uh, year. So it'll be a, a fun, uh, time to, to hear about to see as the kids go. Uh, our 40 for 40 challenge is growing. I saw that it is growing again. Uh, our, our stack of <laughs> treats and uh, toiletries to go to Willow Park Elementary is growing in wonderful ways and uh, we will be presenting them with that uh, following Easter Sunday. So if you have uh, any more that you want to bring, bring them in the next two Sundays, and uh, that will be going to Willow Park Elementary then. The, uh, you are invited, uh, all women are invited to the uh, Five Church Fellowship Dinner put on by the United Methodist Women. Uh, that is on Tuesday, the 23rd of April, and there's more information on the back of the bulletin, and you can sign up in the, on the counter in the hallway as well. I think that's all of our announcements. So let us turn back to our word this day. Today we continue to study this love that is so amazing that we journey together with Christ to the cross. And over the last few weeks we've spoken of how Christ welcomed all to the table at the Last Supper just as we will gather around that table later in worship. Jesus welcomed all, including his betrayer and his denier, and he welcomes all into that meal and into relationship with him. Following the meal, Jesus and his followers moved to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the disciples slept and Jesus prayed and struggled with anxiety and indecision again and again until he finally decides to go through with it moves to welcome his arrest with dignity and resolution. Last week, we spoke of his time with the religious leaders being tried for blasphemy as they chose fear rather than belief. And in our story today, we find ourselves focused on, the, on Christ's last day. <coughs> because next week is Palm Sunday and our choir will be gracing us with a cantata, we're going to focus on the rest of the story today. From Jesus' time with Pilate to his final moments on the cross, we're going to look at the life-changing and truly world-changing day from morning to dusk. So from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 1 through 41, you can look in your own Bibles or the words are going to be on the screens. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, 
Are you the king of the Jews? He answered them, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during their insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. And then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed them over to be crucified. Then the soldiers that led him to the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloth, cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled the passers-by who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads, saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests among the scribes were also mocking him among themselves, saying, He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, that we may see and believe. Those who were with, crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in his way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. And there were also women looking on from a distance. From them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. Those used to follow him and provided for him as when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Here ends the reading. So we start the morning bright and early, as soon as it was morning. If you remember last week, the religious leaders had brought Jesus to a trial in the middle of the night, and now they're bringing their actions into the light of day. And so their fear continues, and they push to have Jesus' ministry and message fully silenced through the lasting act of execution, of crucifixion. And interesting enough, Jesus' response continues to be a silent witness to his true self. Rather than defending his actions or words or in any way asking to get out of this situation, Jesus' silence is truly powerful here. And Pilate is shown to be quite unsettled by it. 
Here, Christ is being charged as a revolutionary, and yet he is silent. Instead of loud, inflammatory speeches, he let others jeer at him and mock him. Instead of defending himself, he simply says, you say so. And yet Pilate decides he would ask the crowd. Now, have any of you ever been in the middle of an uncontrolled crowd? We've got a couple. Been a part of a mob, what you would call a mob. Think through your experiences in large crowds, whether it's sporting events in which the crowd begins to get ugly, jeering or complaining rather than cheering and uplifting, or when violence erupts in the midst of a crowd from violent celebrations of sporting events to festivals intended to rile up a crowd. Some of you heard this story this week. When I lived in Spain, we went to a festival called Carnival. You all, many of you have heard the name Carnival uh, from its uh, existence in Brazil. We know it as Mardi Gras here in the United States. Anyway, there's lots of drinking, dancing, and outright frivolity. And for most of the night, we were standing in a town square at the base of the steps of the cathedral. On the cathedral steps included a group of people doing much the same. But when they began to empty their glass bottles, instead of simply dropping to the, to the ground like everyone else was, the garbages were long overflowed, they decided to throw them into the crowd. So they were standing above a crowd of people, and they decided to throw their glass bottles in into the center of the square. And the crowd did what most would do when faced with that particular danger, it ran, with us in the midst of it, in costumes, our hands full, everyone in the town square tried to escape down the skinny side streets, if you can think of a typical European town with small streets, cobblestones everywhere. It was a terrifying time it, it, when you had the realization that if you fell, not only would you fall onto all that glass on the ground, you would fall and be trampled by the hundreds pushing behind you. Pushed into situations and in danger just because we were a part of that particular crowd. Now this crowd wasn't angry. It was a little bit scared, only for a moment because it, was, it strangely calmed down as soon as it got to a new square. But they moved us without our own intentions. We had to move with the crowd or else we would have been hurt. We had no control over direction. All we could do was try to stay standing and try to stay together and not get lost. The crowd that Pilate spoke to that day was much like that crowd in Murcia a decade ago. Responding in anger and fear, living into the dangerous pull of a large crowd. And when they are given the choice between Barabbas and Jesus, both accused revolutionaries, they, like so many of us throughout history, chose the way of Barabbas, a revolution of violence and fear and war, rather than the true revolution that Jesus called for, a revolution of love, of turning the other cheek, of sacrifice, and of changing the world in a completely new way. It's easier to choose the way of Barabbas, to assume that violence and fear are the only way to make change, because that's the way that we often, what we often respond to. But instead, we find in Christ a new way, a way of peace, a way of love, and this is found in his silent acceptance of a violent execution. Jesus is mocked, Jesus is whipped. It's a soul-wrenching, violent scene, and yet it's one of the center parts of our faith. At the end of his trial, after the torture, they make him carry the crossbeam of his own execution. Reminds me of the stories of those who have had to dig their own graves. Every time I read these stories, I realize the depravity of humanity some repeats itself again and again. When we have gone down that path, when we kill, when we execute, when we terrorize others, we do so with vengeance. And because they beat him up too much, he couldn't keep carrying his cross. 
So the crowds bring in Simon into the mix. Now at this point in the story, Simon is nothing. He's a traveler, a stranger, but by the time Mark is writing down the story, his entire family is involved in the movement of Christ. He, they've mentioned, this is the father of, of, of Rufus and, oh now i got to remember what their names were, Rufus and Alexander? Somebody, Rufus and somebody. <laughs> Obviously really important people in my life. Um, and, and so by the time Mark is writing it down, these people are important. They're, they're known to the community. Simon has become, has gone from nothing, from a stranger, to involved. And in their attempt to put Christ's insurrection down, they actually recruited more people to the cause. So after dragging him into the midst, they get to the proper place, and they nail him to the cross. It's sickening to think about. And yet we sometimes do get too focused on the gore of the situation and forget the meaning behind it. What does the cross mean to you? I ask the kids. But I ask you, what does the cross mean to you? The simple answer that I want you all to know, was anybody paying attention when I asked the kids? Peyton's got the answer for me. What's the simple answer? God loves you. That's the simple answer. We can learn so much more about it. For many, Christ is a stand-in, taking our place on the cross. The wage of sin is death, and so Christ paid it for all of us. And when we are honest about our own sin, this is an incredible gift. Because our own sin is often so great, we find it hard to forgive ourselves. And yet in this moment, God's incredible gift of grace is front and center for the world to see. That in this moment, God's grace is now available for all people. Jesus took our place on the cross. And I mean, he literally took Barabbas' place on the cross. We have a, a story of him taking somebody else's place in this execution. And yet we know and we believe that we too live into that sin. And like I said last week, we're all complicit in the sin that brought us here. We are not perfect. I'm sorry if you thought you were, or if you thought I was. We're not perfect, and we often forget that fact, thinking that we are we're good enough Oh, I, I did pretty good. A few weeks ago, we spoke about Jesus' anguish in the garden. And I explained that in the experiences of humanity, Christ brought salvation. That in this experience of anguish and fear and indecision, Christ meets us there. So too, in the cross, Christ meets us in humanity's moments of torture and of brutality. Christ accepts the worst that humanity has to offer. And once again, when faced with the wonder of God, we throw the worst at him. And in this moment, we see what it means to sacrifice oneself for others. Because even though we, in our own sin, participated in nailing Christ to the cross, on that cross we see the most important act of God can be. That in the moments of pain and the coming death, he speaks forgiveness. In the Gospel of Luke, in their version, as they mock him and torture him, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Even in the midst of it all, he speaks that the most central tenet of his life is forgiveness and grace. Because God loves you. In a few minutes, we're going to gather at Christ's table. And I, I asked you a few weeks ago to focus on what this meal means to you. That at this table all are welcome. Whether you are a sinner or a saint, a betrayer, a denier, a follower, or someone simply wondering. Each and every one of us here is welcome to God's table. Because God loves each and every one of us. And in the liturgy, I'm going to retell this very story again. 
And I invite you to ask questions of yourself as you come to God's table today. What does the cross mean to you? Is Christ's life-changing grace a part of your life? Do you want it to be? If you've been hearing God's call in, in your life in new ways, in, God calls us in incredible ways. If you've been hearing in new ways, I invite you to be in a time of prayer. Whether it's that you've never fully accepted God's love or you're finally understanding that it's there for you too, there is forgiveness and grace and new life. Or whether it's that God is bringing new life in new ways through a redirection, a giving up of sin, a setting aside of addiction, or some way that the cross, the very worst of humanity, couldn't contain the love of God and couldn't contain God from saying to us, I love you. And that is what we receive at this table. Let us pray. God, your story and your love are so great that sometimes we are overwhelmed by the details by what's not there. Help us to know in all we do that you are with us and you love us and you call us into new life this day. Amen. I'm going to tell you a little story about communion today. This morning during the first service, we were sitting ready uh, the Jansen and, and Megan and, and one of the kids was singing today and I'm looking up and I'm watching them sing and I look over and I see that the table is empty. We have forgotten to put out anything for community today. The table was here, but nothing else was. I panicked, ran around the church, handed off the clicker, ran around, looked at all the, the snacks to see if anything there would work for communion. I didn't figure like peanut butter crackers or cookies were probably best. Thought about the sweet bread over here. Finally found some crackers that we keep for those who, who need gluten free at back here. So and some juice. If you have been paying attention, the, the stuff has been sitting on the altar as decoration for the past few weeks. Put it together and came together and had communion this morning. In between services, I worked ran somebody to go get, sent somebody to go get some bread. Uh, it's sourdough bread, so just be warned. <laughs> but it is perfect. So often we have communion as something that is prepared. We find the best bread we can and we set out little cups for every person so that we can each have our own connection and our own time with Christ, and it's a beautiful moment. And yet the, the meal that Christ had with us, or with his disciples, was not something that was prepared for. Christ didn't sit down and say, okay, I'm gonna teach you a ritual that I want you to do forever. Christ sat down at a meal and gathered what was present and blessed it and they shared it together. And so we come today with what is present. With bread that is better toasted, but is a little sour on toasted, that's okay. And juice in one cup. So when we come forward, after we, we go through our liturgy, when we come forward, this is called intinction, and you're gonna get a piece of bread and you're gonna dip the bread in the juice. And that is your communion for the day. We will all partake of the same loaf and the same cup this day because we are one body in Christ. If you'd like to participate in our uh, communion liturgy today, you can look.